I'm going to turn it over to Denise and um, we'll go from there with regards to the topics for this learning session. All right, thank you. Um, so we have two main kind of categories to have a discussion about um, uh, this evening. The first is with um, uh, reference to finances overall. And we have several things that we want to give you an opportunity if you have discussion or questions. Um, we have the um, budget. We also have the OPEB and QCOMP levies. And then um, Director Hoheisel has a resolution um, for reauthorizing a previous authorized board approved referendum authority. If you remember on the finance work sessions that we had, that was that portion, um, I believe, was in green during the bars where we have to formally um, make a resolution that you want to continue that. So I'll let Kristen spend some time talking about that. And then we also have the process of um, the replacement for the uh, vacancy for school board chair. And we've gathered some information for you. These are just drafts based on what other school districts who have gone through this process had. So we have a, a vacancy timeline for you. We have the process um, and uh, some things for you to review and decide how you want to move forward with that. So what would you like to start with? Um, well, I'll just open it up. Why don't we start with the Q comp and the, um, the long term with that, Kristen, and if anyone has any questions. I'm assuming I can refer to the report that you're going to present tonight to kind of get some information. So um, does anyone have any questions about um, those items? So that we can address those tonight. What I would like to say before you start is the handouts you received are the handouts that were in the board packet. They're the information you've seen before. Um, based on requests coming out of finance committee, we've also added commercial industrial property. The the difference that of, of what's presented or what might be in the packet versus what you have is you received a one page uh, item that said QCOM slash OPEB because the tax impact is the same depending on what question you use. Just for uh, sake of clarification, it's the exact same numbers. It's just one says QCOMP and one. They're two separate items as opposed to, is it the combination of the yeah. two? Just that's all, that's the change to the documents. Well, it would be double. It would be double. Right. Correct. And so it was just changing the title to help with the understanding that it's not mixed. Yeah. So that is the only change in these documents. Okay. So. If we were to levy for QCOMP, can that money be used for what we're using out of the general fund, or does it have to be for new things within QCOMP? It needs to be for an instructional development. So it's the QCOMP money goes, the money that we levy for goes to the QCOMP, the agreed upon QCOMP program. Right. So could it go to like the extra four instructional coaches? You could pay for instructional coaches, professional development, or anything related to the Q comp plan that the SCA would agree to using it to as well. So there isn't, to answer your question, there isn't free reign on the dollars that are brought in. There's kind of a two-step process. So even if there are things part of the plan, already part of the plan that we're subsidizing with general, general fund dollars, so we can't just use that. We still have to go to back, back to SCA or if it's already part of the plan. You'd have to go. The, the way that the QCOMP plan works is it's an MOU agreement between the SEA and the school district as far as what. Memo, what mem uh, memo, memo, memorandum, memorandum of understanding. Of understanding. <laughs> so it's an agreed upon, and the memo basically says we agree to the plan as written, which was agreed upon. So what would have to happen is the SEA would have to come back to the table and we'd have to come to an agreement. So, for example, if we. If, if the decision was made to levy for uh, more QCOMP dollars, and what we wanted to do, an appropriate expenditure would be to pay for Q or for um, instructional coaches that are currently being paid for out of the professional development budget. Mm -hmm. You could then say, all right, what we'd like, what we would like to do, SCA, is we would like to take four hundred and thirty-five thousand dollars and pay for those instructional coaches out of QCOMP levy dollars, therefore freeing up that $435,000 out of the professional development budget. That's how, that's how the chain events would have to work. And if we were going to free it up, do, is there any stipulation of what that can be or that can go toward like our overall budget? 
to help offset at that deficit. point in time when it so if it went back into the professional development bucket that bucket is part of our general fund to which you we could say all right we we don't want to spend 435 on professional development now we want to put that into paying for something else or as a reduction or as a reduction we could or a reduce it so in, in effect your professional development with rough numbers our professional development in that scenario would we'd say we're going to spend 500,000 on professional development in totality and then essentially we've taken that 435 as a reduction in professional okay. So the answer is yes. You can use it for other things. So two things, I think, and I'm just trying to check my own understanding. One is you're changing how you fund it. Secondly, you may change the program. It may get bigger or smaller or whatever, bigger probably. Mm -hmm. So those two things are what's going on. Yep, QComp would assume, the QComp plan would have would assume more of an expenditure towards that, is what would happen. And as I understand it, um, we could adopt this tonight. It doesn't become final till December. And during this interim period of now to the date that it has to be certified to the county, you would want an MOU from SEA saying they are comfortable with doing this. Yep, we would. Yep. And if they didn't, then we could, the board at that point could say, okay, since they don't want to do that, then we're not going to levy for this extra money. Mm -hmm. Or, yeah, because even if you wanted to do it, you still need SEA approval Correct. no matter what. Do you have to reopen negotiations or can you just reopen a memo of understanding? Can you can just this. reopen the memo of understanding. Do you have any inkling as to Josiah's thoughts on this? Uh, actually, I do. I had a conversation with him this morning, and he um, is supportive. They understand the, the budget implications and where we are. So I'm confident that we could come to some kind of agreement. We obviously haven't talked about it at all, but I think it would be... Um, I think they'd be more than willing to sit down at the table and look at what that looks like. And I've explained to the QComp executive board that this process, that that's what they would need to do if this would come to be. And do you think there's enough time between now and December to get that done? Yep. Sure. Absolutely. What's the maximum on the on the uh, QComp sheet that you've given us? What's the maximum amount? Isn't the we get the money that we that's in can levy? Based on the number of kids times 69 bucks or something like 91. that. 91. 91. So where does that does that fall between the seven and eight hundred thousand? It in there does. Somewhere? You're looking at about three quarters right. of a million dollars. Okay. And it's based on last year's student count. Yes. Not last October coming. first. Mm -hmm. Right. So October first, 2017. Mm -hmm. So do we? Uh, set a dollar amount tonight, or do we just no? No, what I well, what I would do is uh, you certainly can if you know you're high. I would just say you levy to the max that it's allowed. Yeah. One thing, um, and, and this is more of just a FYI, and, and I'm not quite certain um, how it will play out formula wise for legislatively for QComp. What was in the bills that ultimately got vetoed by the governor was an increase in appropriation for districts that were already approved for QCOM, meaning you know, the state sets their threshold and says we're going to give an easy number. We're going to give a million dollars to the districts that are participating. The request and what had gone all the way up until the governor was let's increase that because districts costs increase and, and you know, students increase and so we don't have new districts that are going to qualify, but they're still going to collect what they're owed. Because that bill was vetoed, we're now going to collect about 98% of aid where we were 100% last year. So we're going to lose a little money in programming in aid because that appropriation didn't increase. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. What I don't know is going to happen because the QCOMP program as it's designed right now is $260 in its totality. That's aid and levy. 91 levy, the remainder comes in aid. 
is the state going to stay? It's still 260, but the aid amount just went down a little bit because of the proration at 98%, so you can get a little bit more in levy. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's going to happen. And so what I would recommend is, you know, say 800,000 or say the maximum of what we're allowed to collect. Again, this, the goal of this is just to show you what the impact would be to our taxpayers. And then that's what we go and we'll see what comes that's back. That's at the 91. That's at the 91. That's at the Yeah. The yes. Okay. When would we know? How would we know if we did the higher than that? Um, when I, well, it, it would be as the state starts rolling out the numbers, it would be, I'm guessing we know July, August. We'll certainly know how that looks by the time we see the forms in September. Again, you're probably talking back to, if you understand that, you're, let's just say you're comfortable as a board with the max, which you know is going to be probably between 7 and 8 regardless because it's only 2%. You're talking thousands of dollars, not, you know, in three quarters of a million. If you're comfortable with that, I'd recommend going to the 800 and just because that's where you're probably going to be with the max. And then once we see those numbers in September, late August and September, we're going to know if we're right in there. Mm -hmm. The other thing, um, question is if we adopt this tonight and we get a lot of pushback from the community during the election or whatever. Even if we had an agreement with the SEEA, we're not bound to go forward with it. We could just say, you know what, we don't want unfunded um, levies, so the board at that time could still back out of this at that point. Yes. The only, and, and this will go for both, the only thing that happens, and I know this came up during our last levy cycle, is this is the only time you can kind of put it all on the table. But what will happen is, is that will be in what, what our uh, taxpayers see in their proposed levy. And so you might get some voices based on a proposed levy, even though we know we're going to scale that back. You just have to be prepared. That's, a, that's what's going to the proposed levy is going to look like. It's going to be reflective of that. And what's the deadline for to, that when's the, when's the last date? When's the date that we have to have this in? We're gonna the June date. It. Well, the first date. board decision, the board decision in June, because I enter that information in July because they're collecting it at the beginning. Of, and we only have one board meeting in July. It's, so the, it's like the end of July. End of July, beginning of August is my timeline of when all that information needs to, to be submitted. Mm -hmm. And then it doesn't show up in tax statements until fall. Right? Correct. So September, October. So you and take action. The taxation is accepted. <coughs> Correct. Action after that comes out. Yes. Right? And then we actually take the action in December. Correct. So is there any reason the SCA would be opposed to what we were talking about before? Moving some of the dollars around? My guess would be that it needs to be a compromise and beneficial to both parties. If it doesn't come out that way, then they're probably not going to be so they wouldn't do it just to help the budget. Is that what? I can't speak for them, yeah. but my guess but, would. I mean, we all know how case. it works, that's right? That's mm -hmm. they're going to want to. They're going to want to know that they're they're being take up, taken care of. Well, I, way too, I can so. tell you, I've asked a couple of teachers. What do you think? Should I vote for this? Should I increase? You know, they're like, does that mean I'm going to get more money? <laughs> it's oh, like, well, I don't think so necessarily. But that's the that's <coughs> the, that's the <coughs> Yeah. I think if one of the budget that's what people think of. Like yeah. is it gonna benefit me in what I can do what I'm gonna do? I think one of the things that has happened too with our teachers that stipend that they get for their performance pay, um, from where it wasn't originally dropped because of a number of things. And um, as we worked through the budget, part of what they did was decrease the stipend that they got. So I'm sure many of them are hoping that if you go out for a new levy that that will get up to, you know, where it was before. Um, so that's probably where that question came from. Yeah. What was the difference? Is it a big amount that it dropped? Yeah. Or, um, hundred dollars, five hundred dollars, thousand? Was it from sixteen to? I want to say it was sixteen to a thousand. It was hundreds. It, it was, was hundreds. hundreds. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it was pretty significant. Yeah, only because okay, that's that's my point. Mm -hmm. I guess that's where I was going with my answer. Is I mm -hmm. think that's the conversation. And are there other places, I mean, if the if we're sub subsidizing the cost of instructional coaches, 
which is part of the QCOMP program. Um, with dollars that come from essentially professional development part of the budget. Is, is there, are there other places where we could make a save, find savings to cover that cost instead of asking the community for, to give more money? You know, this is essentially an increase in what we're asking from the community. So can we honestly say to the community that they're, we've exhausted every option for finding savings in the budget in our professional development? I would say so, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things to remember when we looked at, remember that bar graph that we showed you that with uh, the property taxes and the money that we're taking in. And if you remember on one of those slides, it shows that we're decreasing about 40 some dollars this year from what we had last year. And so if you remember when we looked at those numbers, if you would approve and move forward with both QComp and um, with uh, OPEB, uh, OPEB thanks, my, um, both of those, you'd be back up to where you were last year. So it's an increase, um, but it's not more than they've paid this past year, and that's just because of the growth in the community. Mm -hmm. You know, the amount stays the same, but it's spread out between more people. Yeah. But, and, and I'm just trying to follow the thinking, part of the reason we would be motivated to do this is it would free up money to use in the general fund. But right. if part of that ends up going to teachers because it was significant by however many teachers you got in there, it's not going to free up as much. That could be anywhere from about 500. That was you know, my if we, So if we have five, 500 staff who are on QComp and that can, you probably know those numbers better than I do, but if we have 500 licensed staff who are able to access QComp and they would increase it by $100, then you have 500, or you have, uh, yeah, 500. 50,000. 50,000. 50, 50, yeah. um, yep, and then if they do it 200, 100,000, 300 would be 150,000, which would be pretty much close back to where I think they were before. So of that 750 to eight, yep, you'd have you know 600 instead of 750 mm -hmm. if you choose to do that. And I, I think one of the things is we haven't had the conversation with the SCEA. They may be, you know, nope, we understand where we are, and and you know I think we need to be um, optimistic in those conversations with them. Who would set the parameters for that discussion, with the board? And mm -hmm. You would set the yeah. parameters and, and say, you know, we're not going, to in going back to because we feel a need that we want to provide a, a bucket for catching problems at other schools that we talked about at the last meeting that you'd have this funding bucket. Well, remember, this isn't going to give you additional money, right? We're trying to think of ways to fill those gaps that you have already. So even if you move forward and get the funding for both of these, both levies, that isn't additional money now that you have to play with to be able to fill the gaps. That's money that you're spending already from contracts. Right. So you, um, you know, the money that's coming in isn't new money for us to say, oh, we can put more to behavior supports or more here. We're already using your fund balance, right? So it would decrease the amount that you have to take out of the fund balance. Mm -hmm. So it is. I mean, it is, well, it is additional right money in. It's just not, we can't do anything new right. with it. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're making that statement as if we're, we're going from 5% to 3 point something, and you're saying if we voted for both of these, it would get the fund balance back up to the 5%? Closer. Closer, Closer. not back up. I mean, it, it well, it'd be 1.7 million. Yeah. It's got to be pretty close to... Five percent, doesn't it? If we did yeah. both, yep. if we did both mm -hmm. at the full yeah. amount, mm -hmm. realize you're one fiscal year off, but true. Right. Yeah. yeah. Right. But I mean, when when you say three point four, the world's falling. You go, well, hold it a minute. You know, let's just calm down here a little bit. You just you can't count the total dollars of the QCOP piece though, because you you know that the only the amount that you're trying to gain back there is like the four four thirty five, four fifty, whatever that amount is. So. That amount is what you gain back. It isn't the full. If you did 800 and then. Because that's what's already in the plan. Because that's, that, what's, well, that's in what's in the plan. And that's what's in the general yeah. fund. So anything beyond that, we just have to do new things in QCOM. Mm -hmm. Can you review when we started 
tapping the general fund for QCOMP? Was it right at the very beginning, at the inception of it? And was that the plan for, was it, did we have a plan? Was there any sustainability put towards that when we started it? Was there any long-term projections for that at all? Do you, anyone know? The, well, the plan, from my understanding, from those of you who are around the table, is that when the plan was created was the year before I came. Okay. And um, when we sat down and looked at the plan, we did share that we didn't think it was sustainable at that time. Um, but we went ahead with the plan. Um, I think your, your superintendent previous to me had said, get this done, let's do it. And so um, we went forward with the plan, but the SCEA has now worked with us over the last couple of years to kind of close the gap on what we were um, helping out with with the general fund. And so what we have worked on with them is to reduce expenditures inside of that QCOMP plan so that the plan as it sits right now at this point in time is fairly balanced right now, but as with the plan having yearly increases in it, it isn't a sustainable piece into the future as it sits right now. To fill you in on the context piece of what happened when the interim superintendent was here in the, and it was put into place, we were in conversations of budget reductions at that time. And at that time, we did have instructional coaches. The instruct there have always, well, I shouldn't say always, for a period of time now, instructional coaches have come out of the general fund budget. Okay. QCOMP was then designed, agreed to whatever the plan design was, was to stay instructional coaches can then be part of the QCOMP dollars. The intent was at that time to shift what was being paid for instructional coaches out of the general fund into the QCOMP plan. What ultimately, so back to mm -hmm. was it designed where the general fund has to sustain QCOMP? No, actually QCOMP, a piece of QCOMP was brought in to help sustain the general fund because you're swapping those instructional coaches that existed into a QCOMP plan, which is kind of the same discussion we're having right now. What then happened based on that plan was the instructional coaches became uh, became one for every building so we increased the number of instructional coaches hence not alleviating as much as we thought out of the general fund so we used to have five instructional coaches out of the general fund before QCOMP now we have four because QCOMP picked up one of those instructional coaches and added their own does that make mm -hmm. sense okay because the discussion about having QCOMP or not is about eight years old. Mm -hmm. and we just chose not to do it because previous SCA administration said, we aren't going to take it if we just take the state money. We also want local money. And the board at that yeah. time said, no, we're not taking the local money. You just take the state money or we won't do it. Well, we didn't do it until Nelson came and kind of looked at it from an instructional Different lens. Yeah. One concern I've had with, with QCOMP just in general, kind of more broadly speaking, is is that it's a lot of extra uh, steps, hoops to jump through, it's extra paperwork, it's a lot of extra sort of procedural things that teachers have to think about. And I guess I wonder, if it's working, then that's great. But if it's just more work, more busy work that is distracting from you know what really matters in the classroom, I mean, how do we know if this is working? I know that QCOMP fulfills a big part of what we have to do with the TDEP. Um, I still don't really have a clear idea of how those two things are different. And if we didn't have a QCOMP program at all, what would we be expending to just fulfill those statutes of teacher quality improvement plans, the TDEP? Essentially you know? the same thing. Mm -hmm. They look exactly the same. Pretty much. That's how we have made it as simple of a process as possible is blending the two and making them streamlined. So it, is, it isn't really accurate to say that QCOMP is adding stuff into the process for our teachers and, and I would... So maybe I would say TDEP is the thing that did that, right? Yeah, and that teacher hasn't been around forever, right? That's, it that's relatively new <coughs> But well. it's statutory requirement. Right, right. About five years now? Four or five years? Yeah. Okay. And so I guess that's not very much time to really figure out whether or not it's effective. I mean, sometimes these new systems that we implement, whether it's in our in our district or if it's statewide or whatever, it takes a while for us to figure out whether or not they're having a really positive impact. You know, are they helping teachers do a better job? Do they make the job, you know, more impactful on students? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? 
Yeah, I, I think, I think from, our, yeah. from our perspective, just the alignment that's been able to help with, um, happen with the help of our <coughs> comp coaches. But you didn't have teachers setting goals. You didn't have principals setting goals. Mm -hmm. And how do you know if you're achieving your goals if you never set them? Mm -hmm. So between Illuminate looking at our data and your results policy and now having this in place, now you're going to be able to see and track some of those pro that progress. And what we do, and in fact, just in our administrative team meeting today, Today, our retreat we talked about our principals now are really valuing getting together in August and they have all their data back and we show them what's happening at the state level district level their school level and down to classroom level so when you talk about making progress for you know um, read well our kindergarten readiness and read well by third grade that's where it comes right there so we see them as really well aligned and a good partnership between the SCEA I guess a big question mark for me, kind of piggy, piggybacking on Sarah's maybe, um, possibly. Um, exp could you explain, um, and I, I know you've explained it before, but I just can't hear it enough. So just if you could just explain one more time. Um, is it possible or, or it, to go back to the base where we're not, you know, I know that we added on because we, we were, in, we were, in favor of the instructional coaches we liked it and we added on to it um, which is which is wonderful but now given given the financial situation that we have and some of the other issues at um, some of the other schools that need attention what my question concern is is um, is it is it possible to um, go back to kind of the base with this given given some of the other big ticket issues that we have currently in our district right now that, that we're facing and maybe um, scale back a little bit um, for the time being and how does that look? Is that play into this and if so, how? I would argue that we aren't even at the base yet. We have one instructional coach for the high school for well <coughs> over 100 staff. Would, if you were going to do that appropriately, you would have at least one more instructional coach at that high school. We don't have a full set of instructional coaches for all of the elementary schools. Um, so I would say that from that standpoint of the program, we haven't even reached a base level. Um, so taking away from that, is that an option? Sure, it's an option. But you have, to out, you have to weigh what the impact will be to supporting the teachers in the classroom. And we also have to, you know, look at, you know, we have to look at the dollars. And, and um, you know, for me, we've got some specific needs you know in the classrooms themselves and we've got to weigh these tough um, these tough issues mm -hmm. so um, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, what I hear you saying and, and another ingredient is if you don't do this it's not sustainable in other words if if you don't approve this one of these forms that eventually it's it's not going to sustain itself financially it will I would answer it this way it will be like all of the other programming that we've talked about that regardless of what happens increases as the years go on and so it will become another program that at some point is not sustainable approving this really has as Denise pointed out, has more to do with offsetting the under 5% that you're coming into under a fund balance than it has to do with sustainability. I think the hard part, right, is your con as everyone's contracts, you know, as you go through and everybody's contracts um, change, anything that you have that has a fixed base of money coming in is going to, it's going to impact it. I think what we've been able to do is meet with the SCEA and say, all right, here's where we are um, not, um, you know, balancing out anymore. What can we do differently? And so they've taken cuts in their stipends. We haven't had the mentoring program. We've looked at a number of things to try to keep it co as cost neutral as we can. But, but see, one of the things, if you look out that I'm looking at, as you were saying, the really have the program and have validity and do what it's supposed to do. One, the program <coughs> right now where it needs to be. In terms of, for example, use the example of the, the high school. 
and, I, but there are more elementary positions. So I'm saying, are we ever, even if we do this, are we ever going to be at the, the point where it's not ideal, but it's the way you sort of say, if it's really going to work, this is what you've got to have. Is it ever attainable? Well, it, I think there's a conflation of two thoughts on that one. One is the program as a whole, I wouldn't confuse the program as a whole being effective or not effective or, or doing what it is. The question that was asked is can we bring instructional coaching down to a base? Mm -hmm. Which the answer is, if that's the question, the answer is we haven't reached a base yet because a base in our minds would be each building has a full-time instructional coach so they're not shared and the high school has more than one instructional coach. Um, I would say that that, um, anytime you can get more support than that, it's going to be more effective. Uh, right now, I would say it is as effective as it can be in its second year of implementation as a QCOM plan. Um, but anytime you start, just like any other program, you would look at taking away, the minute you start reducing it, it's gonna lose effectiveness and impact. Mm -hmm. But I, I guess what I'm kind of getting at, Bob, and, and maybe it's too theoretical, is that out there is kind of the promise that, look, when this is up really going and effective, this is some of the minimums you have to have in place, like additional people at the high school or somebody to cover all the elementary schools. And I'm saying, okay, that makes sense. See. But what I see on this, and, and I have, and I've raised this question before, and I think other people do too. I'm not saying instructional coaches don't do some wonderful things, because I think they do. But when it comes to setting priorities, I'm, I'm not so sure, and I'm, I'm just speaking for me, how high this is up there. And I know part of this whole idea with these instructional coaching positions and others was to have a more teaching steps or more types of, uh, I don't know the correct term. Prayer ladder. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I mean, that concept is in there as well. And, and the question I have sometimes is, is this achievable even in the best of worlds? And, and we've gone to the legislature and I plan to continue to do that as long as I'm in this role and, and save more funding. But is that ever going to be enough even to make a little bit beyond that base that was talked about? Yeah, I, I, I think that's a good question, Mike. I, I feel like um, what our teachers will tell you is that it's helping them be much more effective in the classroom, and that's what we're about, right? You talk about kids and learning and, and trying to do the best thing in the classroom, I think our teachers would tell you that when it comes to implementing new curriculum or working with kids who are struggling because they also have behavior pieces that they're very effective in helping um, observe and model, teach, and, and, and help them in the classroom. So will we ever have enough? I don't think we're ever gonna have enough in public education to do the way we'd like it, right? So we have to, we have to make choices, but I think our, we're very lucky in that we have some extremely talented teachers who are in those coaching roles, who even Andrea Schuler, who's a lone ranger at the high school, she's amazing. And people who are struggling, that's her first priority. So she helps them and then helps others as she can. And I, you know, I just want to say, not for one second do I, um, you know, disagree with that or discount that. I just kind of, to Mike's point a little bit, you know, for me, I look at this, I'm like, okay, this is a program, and I, I guess I thought from what I've been asked and talked to people who have been there and my limited knowledge is that it, it's, it was supposed to be a good thing, and it was a state that was kind of helping us and, and whatnot, and somehow it's turned into a stressful burden, and that is where I'm, I'm concerned because what, a burden, the, I, I mean a burden. What's the stressful burden? Uh, to the general fund. So right now we're looking at a non-voter approved levy. We're, we're we're asking, we're not even asking, we're looking at having our voters say, okay, um, you don't have the option here, we're gonna vote on this, and it better be, I, I'm just saying it's, I need to feel really good about that because there are families, many, many families that are taxpayers and they've got, you know, and there are specific issues in the classroom and I feel like we're, we're short a little bit here and there and that's my concern is I, 
I have stress and anxiety over this because, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm a little frustrated with the system. I don't know who to be mad at here. The <laughs> state? Who? You know? Yeah. And I, I think that's that's where my head is at at this moment. And, and I have some of the same things. Mm -hmm. See, and, and I, I think we're mixing up two, three things in, in this. Mm -hmm. um, instructional coaches, I think, is a, a totally different discussion. And you and I disagreed about this four or five years ago. So this is, this is nothing new. I, I'd like to see what other companies of a thousand people spend on research and development and that's what I look at instructional coaches as our prime research and development is the instructional coaches it used to be I hate to sound like an old man it used to be that if you had trouble at the high school in classroom management the principal would come up and say hey you need to go spend some time with Sally May she's having trouble with classroom management well you know how often that occurred or if Sally May ever got better now we've got instructional coaches it's more effective in the elementary because you have smaller numbers you've got one person for over a hundred mm -hmm. at the high school of course that's not ideal but what are the chances you've got a hundred people teaching well at the high school let's say we have 85 there are 15 people that need help who's going to do that mm -hmm. you know you, you're not going to send your counselors in there you've got assistant principals taking care of discipline you got your principal doing other things that's why you have instructional coaches i think i mean you look at research and they say that's the number one thing you should be doing for staff development is instructional coaches and i i said that years ago as to the money that we're asking taxpayers if i look at a two hundred and fifty thousand dollar home and I look at both QComp and OPEB, I'm asking a taxpayer to spend $3.60 a month so that our general fund can get roughly a million and a half dollars. I, the, the prime group I ask about that is the old guys I go to coffee with. I said, here's, what, here's the deal. Didn't explain the whole thing. I said, would you be willing to spend $3.60 more a month? And they go, who'd notice? Now, granted, there are going to be some people who are going to notice, but do you suppose 90% aren't? If that goes up $3.60, that's what the combination of these two would be on the $250,000 home. So when I think about this, and if it gets us, uh, allows us to keep instructional coaches, I'm fine with that. I, but I value, inst I mean, I think that's, more valuable than anything else we do with staff development. And I realize all the teachers don't get it or don't need instructional coaches, but the ones that do, I think that's a godsend for our district. And think about 30 kids in a classroom, and he's not a good teacher, but I can help him. You just impacted 30 kids. Where else are you going to get the money to do that? That's my take on the coaches. I think, too, the, let's say you don't do QCOM. <clears throat> that doesn't automatically mean we don't have instructional coaches. It just means we have less. Mm -hmm. Less meaning what? Do you meaning that because there's two decisions in this. One is you you keep things the way they're really more than that. But you keep things the way that they are. We keep paying what we're paying for our instructional coaches currently out of professional development. Let's say that in addition to not a, not doing this, we say we're not doing QComp anymore. That type of thing. That takes away the money that's that QComp is paying for stuff. That didn't eliminate instructional coaches. That just puts more burden on us as you're learning an innovation department to figure out with the fixed amount of dollars that we have, how are we going to do what's, what's more appropriate? Because this is that level between governance and management is we're trying to figure out what, how to pull it off and you're making decisions to say, here's the sandbox to pull off what we're pulling off. And so it, it's a layered conversation, and I think it's oversimplified to to just say that, or to to George's point, to say that well, let's maybe we should prioritize not using instructional coaches or that. Um, yeah. I don't know. You have a lot of people who will struggle with that. Which I don't think anyone's saying that. But. No, I and. Yeah, I and know. I know this is what keeps coming up, right? We keep talking about instructional coaches because it's really tangible, and we can wrap our minds around it. And I think to George's point, it seems like at the high school because there are so many kids that it maybe is even more effective. But I thought, at least historically, that it's the principal's job to be an instructional leader in the building. And so it feels like K-12 
can they do that job if we because to me I feel like we have to do something about this budget we can't we can't let it be where it's at and so is that an area where we need to ask our principals and whether that's keeping them in the buildings more or whatever it is but that they're doing more of that instructional leading because we don't have we can't do everything we want to do the principal's role is much different than an instructional coach's role. There's a difference between instructional leadership and instructional coaching. It's an entirely different job altogether, and I would argue that our, our principals from early childhood all the way up through the high school are going 100 miles an hour right now, the way it is. Um, I think they are providing um, a great deal of instructional leadership, if not instructional coaching inside of the jobs that they're doing. So I don't know that it would be asking them to do anything more than what they already are doing. Um, with our teachers uh, because they're gonna teachers wouldn't get the individual help that some of them need it just wouldn't be there when you look at Rob Bach at the high school if he doesn't have an instructional coach who can go and help support people it right. wouldn't be and that's where I say it makes more sense maybe yeah. there if, if we do need to look at something mm -hmm. that Rob can't for a hundred people but yeah so can you just remind me again how much does QCOM cost us overall total in totality in the budget, what, what is what are we letter. sending? That's covered by the state and the what, extra. So the, what the, are we what are we spending on all of this? <coughs> the reality is, based on Kristen's explanation before, is that instructional coaches did not come into play because of QCOM. They were already there. Hmm? Okay, so but we're calling it part of QCOM now, no, right? What we're means. calling what happened is you added QCOM and the blending of the growth of instructional coaches. So to Kristen's point, we were able to, the district was able to add instructional coaches, but for all intensive purposes, the district's part of instructional coaching is about 400, a little over 400,000. The QCOMP's portion of instructional coaching is a little over 400,000. Yeah. And I so think that's what reflects it, doesn't it, Bob? So in total, That's what email you sent us. The, to answer your question at this point, the only part of the instructional coaching plan that we are picking up because QCOMP doesn't have the money to do it is the mentoring program, which is a cost of about $30,000. That is what would technically be considered an expense that is a part of the QCOMP plan that we have said, you know what, we all believe mentoring is important. <coughs> We're going to find $30,000 to pay for the mentoring program so QCOMP doesn't have to do that. Yeah. And then half of the cost, right? We collect approximately $1.3 to $1.4 million in aid for the QCOMP program. That's what I need to do. Thank you. Putting QCOMP in a non-voter approved lobby frees up the money in the general fund for the purpose of what? Teacher development or? Anything? No, to close the gap. To close the, the gap. Close the gap. Okay. Mm -hmm. Both OPEB, you know, you, if you would move right. forward on a decision with OPEB and QCOMP is just freeing up some of the money, like George had said, to close that gap. It's not uh, for new things. Mm -hmm. If you need the specifics, May 10th, I had an email to everybody. Yeah. Yeah, that was a good I, one. I, I do, it was a great email. Yeah, I know. I need that. to look just, at that again. Just, yeah, that was a good one. I think, Jen, that's... So then can I just ask another really quick follow-up question? How long have we had instructional coaches here? Is that something we've had forever, mm -hmm. or is that something we've five years? Five or? years, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah, so was something. that kind of in response to the TDEP thing? No, because it actually happened before TDEP came into play. So. So at some point, somewhere along the way, somebody said, "You know what?" Things well, I really think to George, the situation requires that we put in instructional coaches. To, well, to improve whatever well, teaching and learning. I think it's a yeah. point that George had said is if you look at the research and if you believe the research and there's a number of people you can go and read um, the coaching concept, instructional coaching, if it's done well, mm -hmm. is has the greatest impact on your teachers. Right. So I'm assuming as your reading scores and other things started tanking a little bit, it was all right. What are we going to do to help? The other piece is you had many reading curriculums going on within the district, and so I think there's like, how are we going to pull this back together? Well, that's one way. Yeah. Part of it was to guarantee fidelity mm -hmm. in that part. Mm -hmm. uh, I think where George and I you know, are in agreement, and that's a significant part of it, is mentoring people who need help. And what I would argue is that's probably anybody who starts off teaching mm -hmm. or most. And is the total so price taken that 30000 or is some of it in what we receive from the state? The mentoring program is designed for our probationary first-year staff and our probationary third-year staff. We currently, we haven't had a mentoring program 
official mentoring program. I don't know when. Since 2000. So uh, that was it's something that, uh, from us, our point of view and um, others' point of view, needs to be in place to help yeah. onboard and maintain our new probationary teachers. Well, and, and that's the thirty thousand, or that's that's the thirty. Okay. 000. Suppose we took just one part of this issue, and I and I think it's a significant, and maybe it's more symbolic than dollars and cents, non-funded levy or assessment that you're putting out. What kind of a backlash is that going to hurt you more than it's going to help you? It's, I don't know. I think if that's a question for you. It's I because know. it's not. Yeah, I and I think that's where you know I mentioned earlier we dropped. $40 per household about, I think, this year. Um, we didn't have people running and saying, great, thank you for the <laughs> decrease. Mm -hmm. This would bring it back up. Um, I think the other point, Jenna, I just want to make with your thought about the, you know, there are significant issues in the classroom. That's why we reworked within our current budget how we support behavior at every school. We pulled the principals together for two days. We pulled together all our special and behavior supports people to talk about how do we retool for next year. Um, to your point with this, if we do this, it's still not going to be extra money for extra support in the classroom. So part of the reason why that $40 drop happened is our enrollment dropped and the price our tax of the community. Well, tax, 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 base, tax, tax base. base increased. Just more more people living here so they share the load. So instead of you, you know, instead of eight 60 it dropped 868 dropped to or 968 dropped to 928 mm -hmm. so it's just more people sharing the load mm -hmm. doesn't have to do with the amount of kids it, it has to do with the amount of houses that is one element of a of the 37 pages it's it's more it's but with that you we also have an inflationary increase on our operating referendum that was approved too so that almost counters you might have slightly less kids but you're asked you're getting more money on an operating referendum so it Mm -hmm. Mr. Right. Chair, <laughs> um, I think you know. For me, it's always been a philosophical question as to you know, are we if we're able to keep the tax <coughs> is the same um, or less, but still be able to do more. Um, I've found that to be a reason to support, but that's a that's a question each one of us has to answer you guys more than me you know after the 21st but I, I think our the people I know have all thought you know that that's that's reasonable considering they know the costs of of what we do to for our kids so um, I how much time do you think we need for the other thing because this might be a good jumping off point to start talking about the transition sure we can do that and then we can go back if you have more questions about um, uh, the other thing. So we just pulled together, and we means Barb, <laughs> um, pulled together information for you from other districts who have gone through the process of filling a vacancy. And so we have a school board vacancy timeline that is a suggestion when you look at, you know, um, trying to fill the position. And then we also have um, just a, a process um, that we uh, pulled from other school districts who've gone through this and just the legal pieces about um, uh, what you can and can't do, should and shouldn't do. Um, part of this is the first decision um, I see you having the conversation about is do you want to um, try to appoint as a board or do you want to go through a process where people fill out an application and then you call folks in for an interview. I think that's the process uh, Barb had said you've used in the past. And so you would either um, determine together or if you maybe perhaps your personnel committee would say, um, we're going to develop an application and pull together the application, have people submit, and then have them come in for interviews. Um, from the way Barb shared from the last time it happened is there's interview process where you ask each of the candidates their questions and afterwards there's a ballot rating system where you let's say you have five candidates you choose four out of the five and you just continue to narrow it down until you have one candidate after that um, process then it needs to be um, 
we need to have uh, the appointment to the vacant position is effective 30, on the 31st day following the school board's resolution um, if there aren't any petitions for rejection of the appointee within 30 days. Then at the next meeting, the um, person who's chosen would be sworn in and take their seat. So it looks to me like we need to do an application process because that's what's in our board policy. Mm -hmm. Is that what others understand? I did refer back to it, and that's what it looked like to me. It didn't talk about being able to appoint someone. But in a, I think the application process makes more sense anyway. You know, more open, transparent. It seems to me, if you figure this out date-wise, in the best of worlds, that person doesn't take office till August. That would probably be the soonest, yeah. right? It's, it's like soon. August 23rd or mm -hmm. something like that. Because I imagine fun. it'll take you a little time to sit down and develop what, the, what you want the application to look like, and then you post it, and you probably want that posted for a couple of weeks. Then you come in as a personnel group or together and say, all right, here's um, the applicants. When are we going to have interviews? What questions do we want? Call everybody in, go through that process. So I would say probably yeah. at the very earliest August the only thing I would disagree with is I think if people are interested they're interested and I think one week would be enough for them I would to agree. apply I totally agree. because then August 23rd is doable according to the way I figured the, mm -hmm. the dates and if we wait two weeks for applications I think we're even beyond August 23rd mm -hmm. and there's no way to to squeeze it even so we could get somebody in sooner than that not According to the way I've. And so they can't assume office before the 30 day petition period. Right. I think the only thing I saw, and um, Barb, you can double check, but I will not be resigning till after the June 21st meeting. So you can't declare a vacancy on that date. So you'd have to have either a special meeting after the 21st to declare that ba vacancy. Is there a reason for that? Because I haven't, I haven't resigned, so you can't do a resolution until there is a vacancy, and so I haven't resigned until the end of that meeting. So you couldn't pass a, a resolution saying it's vacant because it's not technically vacant until the but resignation. Is there, why, why, what, is there a reason why you need to wait until after June twenty first to resign? Is there something specific? No, I mean I, I, I the only specific is I want to finish out that meeting on the twenty first. So we could have um, our regular board business meeting on the 21st. We say bon voyage, and then we have a special meeting that same night right after it. Because I have a letter basically resigning that it will be hand delivered to whoever the board chair is at that time, okay. resigning as of 12.01 on June 22nd. Okay, so before June so the meeting would have to be the next day. <laughs> you could have it the next day because that's when the vacancy yeah. actually. Yeah. Yeah. Or we so could stick around at the same night. Yeah. You could hang out. <laughs> Twelve oh one. Yeah. Twelve oh one. He would love that. It'd still be the twenty second. So we could have a meeting at eight o'clock on the morning of the twenty second to just pass a resolution declaring yes, a vacancy. Yeah. yeah. So what else do we need in here? Do you, specifics. Um, well, I think I think it's really up to you. But I I think I like it. Sounds like there's a consensus that you could do this within a week, mm -hmm. just to to set up that timeline. Well, and maybe we need to write some of those in, like you said, June twenty second. So yep. write that. So you in. could do June twenty second special, special board meeting, meeting, declare vacancy by resolution. Well, there's no reason we can't develop the application before. That doesn't have to happen after June 22nd. Right. No, I, I was hoping you'd have it probably tonight. She's Is got this the one that right was here. used yeah. in 2007? Is that? Uh, no, I got this from a different resource and kind of over and combined a couple of things. Um, open to suggestions. I will say I think it's important. Um, 
Maybe all of you remember when you pull out your affidavit that you put into the scene in order to run for school board. There are certain criteria. That's number six. I think it's important to keep that piece on there. Mm -hmm. You know, why you're interested, what do you see your role are. I mean, all that. I can leave up to the board or the personnel group. However you want to divide it up on who's going to finalize the application. Tom, who's on the personnel committee? That'll be me. Me? I think I'm on personnel. Yeah. I, think you are. I thought it was Mike, Tom, and I think Mike's on. I don't think you're on personnel. I'm on. No. I think. <laughs> I, think I, I don't think I am this time around. I think it's just Tom, basically. No, it isn't no, just me. Full. There's three of us. No, I think it's Tom, George, and Mike. Yeah. If Hmm. Well, yeah, because we worked on Denise's contract. Yeah. That's oh, why. I thought that's that was you guys have been here, but that's the answer. It's George, Tom, and Sarah. It's George, Tom, and Sarah. Yeah. Okay. It is Sarah. Sarah's like, I thought. You've had a lot of issues. Well, uh, <laughs> my point is, even in, in terms of working with this, yeah. The specifics that may go to that committee. Well, I say let's let's work on it right now. I mean, this is like pretty pretty close. Yeah, I don't know what more you I need. I think it's fine. I don't see. I, I think don't nailing have any down issues. these dates. I think nail, let's let's do it. Let's just get this done. Um, so, I, I don't quite understand why we have to have this time crunch thing, but maybe that's something I just I don't know. Which time you can't and not, you can't resign. You can't. You have to resign. You have to officially be resigned and done before we can have a resolution. Correct. It seems weird that we can't have a resolution and date it forward. You know, like. I could change my mind. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's okay. Why, that's why. Okay. So what I have here, June seventh work session, which is tonight. June twenty first board meeting, board officer reorganization. June twenty second would be. Why would you reorganize? Let me just ask. How can you reorganize before? Well, I would resign. I can resign the my board chair position uh, at any point. Okay. Prior to six twenty one, well, we're doing that. Right? Yeah. Develop application prior to six twenty one. Six twenty two, you can put the application on the website. Right. Mm -hmm. Do it for a week. Six twenty nine. So you close it that Friday. Mm -hmm. 29th of Friday? Yeah, 29th yeah. of Friday. Yeah, do it at 3 o'clock on the 29th and then interview those people sometime between the 29th and. Uh, mm -hmm. The 12th is the next week, right? 12th is the next, is the July meeting. Mm -hmm. I'll do it between the 29th and the 12th then. Is everybody comfortable with these questions? Um, I'd like to look at this a little bit. Yeah. Um, you said this is similar to what you've used before, Barb? Yes. The questions? Okay. Mm -hmm. They look fine to me, so. I'm laughing because the only thing I would say if I were throwing this on, I need more space. Oh, yeah, you do. <laughs> <laughs> you but that's me. That's going to be part of the requirement. You may not. Brevity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> That'll tell us something about the <laughs> yeah. yes, Whether they're starting to write on the <laughs> yeah. It's going to be online, though. We're going to ask you if they're red, George. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. What color are you? Oh. Well, would we or would we not? Re uh, interview all applicants well I guess we'd have to see how many we got we yeah got 25 we're not going to interview 25 people Side not that I think to we'll interview get. then it gets tough trying to well, decide who gets cut out of that list of 25 mm -hmm. you owe it to somebody I mean, who applies it? yeah the oh. question is do we need it can we can we just look at the applications I think you need to interview see if we can't make a process or make a decision based on that I would be more in favor of interviewing everyone who comes in, give them the, um, the um, mutual, yes, everyone has the same opportunity. Mm -hmm. Well, in the way they did it, 
previously as you were given a time slot. Like a five minute, whatever. Yeah, well, exactly. Or whatever it minutes, is. But yeah. But I'm just say, saying, give them a yeah, time slot to yeah. go through the interviews. Yeah, we got a uh -huh. half hour. Right. And we may be there all day, but that's right. I, I think the, that's fair to me, um, as opposed fine. to choosing prior to. I was just trying to think in terms of saving time, but I, I personally would prefer to interview people too. But and I think we have to one more step. Right, and I, which I I support that. I think mm -hmm. we need to look at one thing in the calendar, and that. 10 days or whatever is the 4th of July yeah. in that week. A lot of people, people will be gone, gone that week. Yeah. You might want to look at maybe the 9th or like right after. Mm -hmm. The week and of the 9th. We interview to people and then make that decision like that day. I get to interview everybody and then come up with something. You, you also right. have well, a meeting July 12th where you could actually talk about it. Yeah. What they did in the last time was interview everybody and then board members kind of said I want to keep John and Joe and Mary and you said I want to keep Mary and Sam and Sally and eventually you got enough votes to keep a small group of people and then you got smaller and then you got smaller and then eventually ended up with one yeah that's kind of what we did with the work, sort of. world's best workforce is we tried to pick out the top can mm -hmm. people prioritized mm -hmm. and then you took that mm -hmm. on where you had commonality and worked from that list. The voting process we used last time was available with all the people that interviewed names on there. Say there were five names. Um, you went you voted for four and then the next time you voted for three and then eventually it came down to two. What format of a meeting was it? Was it like a like this type of meeting, or was it at a formal? It was um, a special meeting we held okay. at the district office. Okay. Um, you know, the board kind of sat up front. Um, the candidates we had a table and a microphone. Um, I believe we actually think we we ran up live on Valley Access TV, um, and then audience members in the back. Okay. Mm -hmm. Tom, it has to be an open meeting, doesn't it? Yep. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it's, it's posted uh -huh. as a special yeah. meeting. Okay. Mm -hmm. So are, are, is the suggestion then that we have the meeting, we have the interview meeting, and then the next, we would come back another time to decide, or could we do it all? This says special meeting to conduct interviews and possibly vote for appointee. And that, that's a choice for the board to make. Um, Previous practice has been at the end of that, you come down to one person, and you, mm -hmm. you could adopt your resolution that night, appointing you know that person. So then the next day, the 30 days begins. Mm -hmm. So what date are we looking at for that interview? July 12th is what I have heard. I think that's, that's the board meeting. That's the school board meeting. No. I mean, that's your July meeting. 9th, 9th or 10th. Yeah. What's the, what day of the week is the 9th? The ninth Monday, is Monday. 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 Which I, I guess if, you know, looking at, some people may be still out of town Monday. Maybe Tuesday would be better. I think Tuesday's better. 10th? July 10th. I'd like either the 9th or 11th. The 12th. Only because my wife has a very important doctor's appointment that day. Which yeah. day? Yeah. On Tuesday or Monday? On Tuesday. Um, so you'd rather do it Monday? I'd do it Monday or Wednesday. Wednesday. We can oh. do it Wednesday the 11th as well. The day yeah, before either the one of those would work with me. That works with me too. July. I hear Wednesday. July 11th. Time. It kind of depends on how many applications. I think it depends on how many applications. You get. Mm -hmm. um, keeping in mind, some people may have full time jobs. Um, you may want to offer them kind of late, late later in the day, yeah. you know, late afternoon into the evening. Yeah. In and and Barbara, go. maybe a way to do that is in the application to have a preferred time, and we'll try to honor it, but we can't guarantee it. And then you figure your slots from that. Because mm -hmm. some people might be. Yep, I can do it any time, and others may be, well, do you be ideal if it was four to five or something? Mm -hmm. So the review applications, when would we do, or would we, we wouldn't need to do that if we're going to interview everybody, right? 
Yeah, but are we going to get them? How are we? Will we get to see them before we interview them? The interviews or your the applications? Sure, on the ninth or tenth. Yeah. Get a digital form of stuff. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, so if we collect them on the 29th, basically we can see them any time between the 29th and July 11th, right? That's over. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just give me and, a moment to print them out. Well, and I was going to say, didn't with some applications, maybe it was for superintendents, did we come into the office and look at them mm -hmm. there? Mm -hmm. That was the mm -hmm. superintendent. Yeah. Yeah. We didn't let them leave the office. That, might be, yeah. that yeah. might be a good idea. That might be a good idea for yeah. this as well. We go to the office yeah. rather than, yeah. Take a look. One other question I have for you in the past. You have, a, as a board, have offered the MSBA future board member information session. And I've had a few requests from people if, you, if that's going to happen again. With the August uh, deadline for folks um, uh, filing. filing for the um, vacancies, do you want to do that again? When do you want to do that? Yeah. Do you want us to con I can have Barb contact MSBA and talk to the folks who did it before and see what dates they might have available? Yeah. Something else, though, that that triggers with me, if you go to the website, they have information, so you think, what you, you, in other words, I'm saying, even apart from that, which I think is a good idea, they could go to the website, sure. and if we provided that as a suggestion to applicants, you know, sure, and we have because it helps get them in the frame of mind, mm -hmm. etc. And then we also have uh, uh, publications that Carissa has developed that we can update for people also with the basic information. Um, the people that came last time were very good. That Gary Lee, I think, is the guy. And was it Kathy? I want to say Kathy Miller. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, they were <coughs> they were good, and I think they informed a lot of people who were there. What being a board member might be like. Would your preferred time to be before the application goes live? I'm just thinking we got a couple weeks. I don't know if that gives us enough. <coughs> this application? Oh, wait, yeah. are you saying this I mean, you can now? use it for two purposes, I suppose. <coughs> are you talking about for next fall? I was talking about for next fall, but I think okay. what Barb is saying is if you did do it early, <coughs> if somebody was interested, they might be able to come in here before they apply, or they might here and so we could see if somebody could come now both purposes. Yeah, so we could do it towards the end of June. Yeah. Uh, if you did it, you know, and you had it in the, I think we had it at 4 or 5 o'clock last time, and then people could come and. Well, and it works both ways. Because mm -hmm. somebody so may kind of cool apply idea. for the short term, not get it, and then they decide, well, I'm going to go to the voters. I, I, they remember, very I, well come, I was out of town for when we did it last time, but I remember thinking, it might have been nice to have it earlier because it was right at the time of like signing up, I think, or right maybe a week before or something. Yeah, so maybe nice try to have it in June or something where if you're thinking about running, yeah, you kind of find out a little bit about it beforehand. So we'll have Barb um, call Gary and Kathy and see when they might be available. Good. Yeah, maybe like the 25th or something, right in the trial that's yeah. open, yeah. Good night. Oh, Gary Lee um, just hit me. So I have a yeah, question then really about yeah. the, the officer situation. Like, is that what? I don't, I don't understand how this is going to work. I mean, are we going to reconfigure I, all of our officer positions? And if so, do we have to do that before Tom leaves? Like, I kind of want to talk about that. Talking about bit. the officer position, what the process um, is going to be for that. Well, according to Maggie, um, because I'm leaving, we have to vote for a new chair. Whether that opens up the whole thing to everybody, that's a conversation we can have. Tom, but I was planning on just opening up the board chair. Yeah. Why wouldn't the vice chair become the chair? I, I had presumed that was going to be the case. However, Maggie indicated that that's not the proper procedure. Okay. What she indicated is that if something happens to the board chair, the vice chair takes over the duties until you can have an election. And so um, she said with the, you know, especially because it's a 90 days, remember when we talked about that, it's 90 uh, days back, mm -hmm. um, 
then you have to go through the process of reelecting your uh, chair. Yeah, we all thought it was just obvious. Yeah, that's what I okay. thought. Yeah. And, then and then we obviously need a new vice chair. If because, we, in a way, if, like, if we the logic of it mm -hmm. is you don't have to have a vice chair. When you have a vice chair, the reason for having it is to take over if the chair is Chair can't, unable. yeah. But so I I'm think it's not on a long-term basis. I think oh, that's the... Okay. Yeah, that's this different. is just to fill this time period between the 21st through the end of December. So do we just need to do it? We just need to have an, a separate election um, for chair, just chair, or... Well, then we and then decide. if, if it's a current... If I think the conversation would be that you'd have election for the chair, depending on who that person is. If that person holds something other... Yeah, then you'd have an election for that and the okay. dominoes would fall and until they stop. When would we do that then? The twenty first. Oh, uh, the twenty first. Yeah. And then, do you get to vote on that or yes. not? You do get to yep. vote on that because I haven't resigned, so I can resign my board position. I have, I can resign my board officer position, but I have not resigned from the board till the end of that meeting. Okay, so it's it's sort of like if you weren't leaving and you just didn't want to yeah, be chair say, anymore, exactly. you say for I'm some done. reason I can't, I don't have time right. or new job or Got something. A cold or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I throw my hands up. So that could always happen that somebody At is in point. a position and they say I, I need someone else to take over exactly. this, and then we would just have to go yep. through the same procedure that we did before. Correct. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Where in the agenda do you see that happening? Um, <laughs> During I action. This one every day. <laughs> uh, I would say you can put it wherever you want. Under it's an probably action an action item. item. Yeah. Action. Mm -hmm. okay. Back to that vacancy timeline, yes, if I may. Yes. Um, August 12th, then, is the 30-day period for mm -hmm. petition. Yes. August 12th. So then the 23rd would be the seat successor. Mm -hmm. That's how I got it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one other thing, um, back to the vacancy and the interview process itself. Um, I have reached out to counterparts in other districts. Um, I have a good array of sample questions. Good. So when you come in to look at the applications, I'll let you take a peek at the sample questions and see if there's any changes you can. So are we? So we'll just. Are we good with these questions the way they are for now? Or no. the, the I think when the interview. When actually, when actually interview. Yeah. So okay. Yeah, I think well, couldn't we, couldn't we too? I mean, if, if somebody's got, as you look through these, and, and somebody's oh, yeah, uh, something came up for consideration, you would think to you'd be able to, to this. Yeah. I think the key would be to make sure you run it by Kathy Moen to make sure you're not asking a question that's not violating. Yeah, so, yeah, but yeah, I think you would, you would always maybe read something and you want to clarify what they said, so you don't want to have to just stick to the script. Can I, can I just make a, I don't know, I, I'm just going to say this. I'm, I don't feel super strongly, I'm just going to raise the question. Question number three, please identify and describe how you would address what you believe are the district's three most important issues. I'm a little bit concerned about divisiveness. And if, the, if that three issues certainly kind of falls into some, I don't know, I'm, I could be completely wrong. Maybe that's not even an issue. But um, I had a question. Say, say more just, about that before well, you go on. What, what do you anticipate somebody would put down that would be? I don't know. Oh. I don't know. I just, I don't know. I'm, I just, I don't, I don't actually really have a fully formed thought here about this. I just think, I don't know if I like that question. So I'm wondering if we could put um, what skills, perspectives, and expertise do you have that will enhance the work of the board? It just feels like we want to make sure that we have the questions be really as open-ended as possible. I guess I'm worried about the three most important issues as being like something that might somebody might just sort of make a list and say fix this you know these three. Yeah. I apologize if I'm not being super clear it's I, not clear I don't in my head <laughs> I don't mind your second question but I'd like to keep number three I think it's important that they have a perspective on what the three issues are that they think are significant and more how would you address I mean it's easy to say there are three crucial issues 
no matter what you put down. But if you don't know how to do anything about them, you're just a complainer. So I'd like to see that, <laughs> you know, frankly. How do you really feel? Hold back, George. Oh. Well, well, I, I think, think that was true. George's follow-up question. Yeah. <laughs> what are you going to do about yeah, it? Yeah, what are you going to do about it? What skills? What yeah, skills? I like the two. Oh. Perspective? Actually, okay. Yeah. So what skills, perspective, and expertise do you have that will enhance the work of the board? It kind of it's 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 a little bit of an adjunct to number four. It is, um, and number four to me is like okay, I was involved in this PTA and I did this committee and I did that and I'm I've been involved in you know to me it's more like experiences, um, and if it's if it's if it seems too repetitive, I'm fine. That's just not a problem. One more time on your question. Can you read that, Sarah? What skills, perspective, and expertise okay. do you have that will enhance the work of the board? Because I think I that like gets that. A little, add a little bit what George was talking about, too. What do you bring? And mm -hmm. It tells you if they've been following it at all. I, I'm OK it. with that yeah, question. I, like it. I think it's good. OK. And would you like me to insert it then after three, make this a new four? Sure. So it comes before the PTA. Yeah. I think that's good. I like that. All right. Any other questions about the process or what you want? No. Otherwise, I just want to say this is great. Thank you, Barb. Yep. You need a Superman cape, mm -hmm. a Superwoman cape. <laughs> she wears it's it. Great. Yeah. <laughs> it's there. It's just like imaginary, right? Um, one of the other things that we um, want to just <coughs> remind and review with you is the um, uh, the resolution um, to reauthorize a previously authorized board approved referendum authority, and I'm going to ask Kristen to speak to that. So, and, and this is another, um, I'm going to go ahead with what happened legislatively. This, this item in particular, the $300 item that boards every five years would go through and make this motion and, and adopt, was actually approved um, and in the bill that went to the governor that it would just happen automatically. Essentially saying we're not going to require boards every five years to go through this motion We're just if you've already done it. It will go in perpetuity. That was it, it, it And it's a non-financial issue. That's how it was viewed from the Department of Education again Unfortunately, it was packaged in the um, in the bill that the governor vetoed so it, it was there legislatively and that's why I held on to it I had mentioned it before and said it could come but I had to wait to see because it might have been a non-factor so I will back you up um, five years. The leg legislatively, there was, um, you know, there's always questions as it relates to equity in districts that can't pass referendums. And I particularly think like Brooklyn Center and what- North Branch. A lot North of rural, branch. a lot of rural districts yes. that are small. They, they can't, they can't it's do just it. just no money. Right. And so this was legislatively, uh, the government's way of, of allowing those districts to at least get like to catch up to get the equity piece to get $300 what it was for districts that already had at least $300 in voter approved authority you don't get new money you just swap it out so if, so we went to our voters in 2013 and we approved $1,496 in change then we turned around and we said we're going to take the three hundred dollars and we're just going to put that into a different cat we're going to put that into the non-voter approved category we didn't get more money we were still collecting the one thousand four hundred ninety six dollars we just switched categories this is saying our five years are up we need to make this decision again so if we didn't do this, we would lose 300. We'd be down to 1196. No, nope, we would still collect. Oh. But that collection would still that collection would we would still collect the money that would now ex, that would now expire under the voter approved authority. Okay. As opposed to being a non-voter approved item. 
Okay. I, and I will, uh, and I hate the three board members that were on at the time. The conversation that was had was our voters really already gave us approval for this. Mm -hmm. So we're comfortable switching categories because they said it was okay that they've already approved this. Mm -hmm. So we won't lose money, but what would or could happen is when um, our operating referendum expires, then it's all on the table again as opposed to we already have three hundred dollars that they had approved originally that's now set aside we don't go back down to zero correct so it would only really impact if we expired and didn't renew or didn't get a new correct and when will our current levy expire 22 uh collection year of 22 it would be you know you're looking we'll at november of 21 mm -hmm. of 21 right because mm -hmm. it would be for the following year yeah. and so what I would be doing now again I was hoping that legislatively it was it was it's just a process it back to you have multiple steps that create confusion as opposed to help with transparency mm -hmm. I will be in front of you asking you just to reauthorize a resolution that was already passed because we have to do it to maintain so Does that part of the omnibus was yeah okay yeah so when will you be in front of us with this? Uh, if, if you're comfortable with this, I can put this, well, we can, I, I, if you don't need me to speak to it, it can go on the 21st or if that's the decision because that this is all there is. Um, and it can be approved on the 21st. Otherwise, I'd be looking at the July meeting. I think what might be nice because it's a little bit tricky is to present it tonight, mention it. And then vote on it. It's, but it's tonight. not on the it's agenda. It's not on our agenda for tonight. Oh, oh I got you. Well, you could add it. I mean, it's ready. This is it. Mm -hmm. It's completely up to you. Or I can speak to it as a report. You know, I do have a few more handouts for the audience just so it's made aware and you can do some. I, I mean, I'm prepared because this is it. Okay. It would just be this conversation again on television. And when's the deadline for renewing it? Back to it's this summer. Because again, it's for. The next levy cycle i guess i would rather put it on i know you, you won't be here the next meeting right correct then i'd rather put it on the following and you can speak to it and then vote on it in august if you're not in a hurry rather than add it tonight you could report on it on the 21st and vote on it in july mm -hmm. i'm not here to report on the 21st oh, you're not here. Like I say, I would, again, I'm willing to do it tonight. Could you add it as an agenda item tonight and just mm -hmm. do the reports and she's got it and ready to go? Maybe we could do a little video. <laughs> she's like, ah, no. <laughs> I prefer speaking to people as opposed to just <laughs> FaceTime. Yeah. The reason I, I do like the idea, one, get it and then you get some time to think about it yeah okay well it's yeah seems like a little bit of a no-brainer so like I say it's there and it would have been there if the government could have gotten along well when you have a 1,000 page yeah. omnibus bill I mean there is that there That's is small. a case to we be don't need to get into blame right. game seriously <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's enough so, for everyone so to pass that right. so yeah, yeah. Um, do you, yeah, what is the do you want Kristen to share uh, amend the agenda and have her share something tonight and then wait until July 12th well you could approve it without me right yeah. I mean my question is you know I like to your point it seems pretty simple pretty cut and dry it doesn't seem like it would need this massive presentation you could add it although here's what I'm thinking a little bit too we got a lot on the agenda mm -hmm. in terms of uh, QCOM, OPEB, etc., and it may get lost as well. So maybe it's better to wait. I'm a, I'm pretty flexible. I'm yeah, uh, Tom, I'm, what do you I, think? I, I'm just going to defer to the majority. We can add it as a report, and then you can vote on it on the 21st as an action item tonight, or so you can have the report tonight. And the explanation is as long as your public questions are, sure. because it truly is a three-minute brief for me. I think for me, I just don't like adding anything. If it doesn't have to be added, then I, that night. George, Sarah? I just soon get it done and get it off, but I understand what you're saying about the OPEB and the Q comp and then this. I mean, they all kind of do run together then, you know, and you'd like that to kind of, I mean, I, I think I understand that and I remember the past 
uh, conversations mm -hmm. when we did pass it, but if you didn't go through that, it might be good to well, so look it up and see what it's about. Mm -hmm. What What is the deadline for having to turn this in? Summer. September. It, it's so, it, September 30th? Is that what it says? <clears throat> mm -hmm. Yes. I'm okay with well, Shelly's. So then we can wait. Yeah, I'm okay with Shelly's um, yeah. suggestion. Um, I just want to think about part fine. of our role is to inform the public. And if we're right. putting I, too much I, on there, it's I'm like, not oh my gosh, what are we talking about? Dying on the sword over this. So it would, yeah. I'm, I'm completely okay with waiting. Would you like it on July 12th then? And then sure. have the report on July 12th and then approved in the sure. first in August. meeting in August? Sure. Okay. Maybe right. part of the application process. <laughs> understand this and be able to explain it. One other, <laughs> yeah, one other thing that, yeah. again, and, it, and it, the same holds true, honestly, for we had a obviously a lengthy conversation on QCOM. Same holds true with OPEB. These are just your impacts. They're going to only allow us to do a certain amount because you can take, you know, it's the implicit and explicit rate subsidy, and they those are actuarial calculations that they're going to say, oh, no, 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 you're only limited to this dollar amount. Mm -hmm. And so just realize that, I mean, OPEB, if you're going less than, you know, 800000 then I'd set a dollar amount. Otherwise, you can go high, but realize we might be limited to 850000 because that's the max we can go to. Mm -hmm. And who decides mm -hmm. that? Uh, well, it's going to be the, the information that I submit to the Department of Education, and it's going to be probably our implicit rate subsidy, and I just, and they're going to look and say, this is the calculation less this, this, and this, and here's your dollar amount. So... You could say up to a million. You could say up to five hundred thousand. The lower you go, we're probably setting the limit. The higher you go, we could still get capped before we reach that limit. Okay. So go with your comfort level on impact, not necessarily the dollar. I mean, we'll get as much as we can, but just so you recognize that. So if we say a million tonight, we can still come back in December and say eight hundred thousand. You absolutely could, or the state, or the state could say. 800,000 you say we don't like 800 we're doing five yeah I mean you mm -hmm. still have that opportunity and can you just remind just again are we still at like about one two million every year mm -hmm. for that and last year how much of it came out of the general fund and how and much came out of the half, trust right? it, we're it's Did half we do half and half we last split. year it's it's a million that comes out it's and it's not well a million comes out of the trust mm -hmm. the remainder comes out of the general whatever fund. it ends up being correct the okay trust total do you know what the trust total is off the top yeah of the trust the fund balance of the trust that closed last year was about nine million dollars so assuming we draw a million down we're at about eight million dollars and so it we could one option we would have is to to just draw down the trust and when the next um, voter approved levy came up we could ask for those funds again you can no longer issue debt the way we issued I mean you can do it as a vote you could do it as voter approved if you so right. choose but you can't issue like we issued 20 million at that time okay you can't do it in a big lump sum to cover the liability well maybe vote no voter approved you can it's non voter approved that you can't right because that's what we're doing every year correct right we're saying it can mm -hmm. be and then then it's capped yes but if we were to do what what established the trust fund in the first place was it a voter approved levy it was a non voter approved levy Oh, and at that time it was allowed to do it, non but now we would have to do it in a voter approved Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we would have the capacity to do that, and it would just be left up to the community to decide yes. whether or not we did that. Okay. Good to know. Did we cover everything? I believe so. Resolution, OPEB, QCOMP, we have your process, MSBA session. Thanks, everybody. We get started at 6.